For nearly 50 years, this has been the stunning sight for millions who travel outside our nation's capital. As you come around the Beltway, you see these incredible spires reaching to the heavens. This is a landmark in this place. For Latter-day Saints, the Washington, D.C. Temple makes an even more important statement. This is just such a beacon of beauty in this emerald green firmament of Washington, D.C. Following renovation, the doors were opened once again to all. As we invite people to come and see, it has a remarkable response and a great interest. This has value, meaning, and purpose to all that come to see it. And then the day of renewal, a rededication of the house of the Lord, a rededication to faith in Jesus Christ. Every temple is a new window to heaven, which means angels can come down, the Savior can walk the halls. This temple has been renewed. There's more light. It's just a magnificent temple. The Washington, D.C. Temple, a sacred monument in a city of monuments. All who see it marvel. This structure exudes light and a power that encompasses the surrounding grounds. This iconic landmark stands on lush, sprawling 52 acres and can be seen along the Capitol Beltway in Kensington, Maryland, 10 miles from the United States Capitol. The Washington, D.C. Temple recently underwent years of extensive renovation. Each room was refreshed, transformed, or improved. And in April of 2022, for the first time in nearly half a century, its doors opened to everyone who wished to see it. Welcome to the temple. Latter-day Saint church leaders welcomed media to tour the temple. It had been closed for more than four years for renovation and because of the pandemic. On this day, our maker is proud of us. The Reverend Amos Brown of the NAACP joined them, making some very powerful statements in support of this church and this temple. The, the open house today affords the church the opportunity to get out to the masses around the globe the truth about the spirituality of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Church leaders hoped the Temple Open House would reach beyond the tours. I have been talking to people in the hotel and in restaurants and different places, and they feel that this is their temple. For us to be here, it really is a, a nexus point where all the rest of the world, and it helps them understand the temples that might be in their own countries, their own communities later on. Media Day of the Open House brought 150 national, international, and Washington-based journalists. I grew up in this area, so I will always drive on the highway with my parents, and so for me it's kind of a full circle moment. I was really captured by the experience in the celestial room where we had to be quiet, and just our elevation through the temple. I hope this feeling stays, and it's something I know I'll remember for a lifetime. Gary Gilliam, former NFL player, is now a social media influencer. He was happy to accept the invitation to see the temple. I wanted to come and learn a little bit more about it. Um, sacred spaces are sacred beyond what they're teaching, but the spaces themselves, you know, to learn in those areas, it was tremendous. When Bachelor Johnson posts about the church on social media platforms, people pay attention. To experience a temple, it was surreal. I mean, this whole experience has been like top tier for sure. He played football for both BYU and the U of U and says he serves in the temple every week. Everybody has their, their mission they serve on earth, and I think part of mine is, um, you know, being candid about what I believe. And politicians were also on the VIP tours. Before the rededication, to get people to get a chance to look inside, I think, is a wonderful thing. It's an honor to be here. Apostles and their wives led those first tours for some 4,300 invited guests. I felt the spirit, and I found myself praying for the people that we took through the tours that they would feel the spirit as well. Regardless of who they are or where they came from, they sit in the celestial room and they are still. And I think they, they're reminded that there is a God. We always marvel when we see it, but to be inside and to see the people and to see 
what you do to inspire people's lives. I can tell you we're a better community because of your presence. The warmth, the sincerity, the welcome that we received makes you want to stay. I just felt like I was in this place where the Lord was. I could feel the spirit of the Lord surrounding me. The building is there to help us focus on our families and on, on God's presence in our lives and our sense of community. And uh, we share that, that sensibility in the Jewish tradition as well. Elder and Sister Gong said they tried to make sure each person left with greater understanding. It's been wonderful to share the temple with people who have a sense of the sacred and the holy and who are looking for places in their lives where they can feel the spirit. I hope they remember that this is a place that connects them with God, connects them with each other, connects them to their own hearts and their best, truest selves. There are remarkable stories about the history of the property and the temple construction. Hear them next. Latter-day Saints believe deity comes to sacred spaces. Divine by Design is a history of the Washington, D.C. temple by award-winning journalist Dale Van Atta. The ordinances and the work that goes on inside with the members are designed to be divine. The Washington, D.C. temple was the 16th and the first in the eastern United States. It was the last piece of undeveloped, majestic property overlooking Washington. With ownership over the centuries came a connection to faith. Colonists settled it in the name of King James I of England. Latter-day Saints used the King James Version of the Bible. John Carroll became a Jesuit priest and built a chapel there. Daniel, his brother, a member of the Continental Congress, spoke in favor of the guarantee of free exercise of religion. Then a farmer, Albert Ray, owned the property, and he often rode his horse to a certain spot to pray exactly where the temple is. During both the Revolutionary War and the Civil War, no battle was ever fought on these 57 acres. Jewish businessmen were the last owners. It's hard to imagine that in 1962, this pristine property was within days of being sold to a developer for commercial buildings. Robert Barker prayed before a lunch meeting with one of them and made the request. We want to buy it to build a temple there. And then he moves straight into a very powerful and emotional speech of gratitude to the Jewish people for having shown the Latter-day Saints how to build temples, the importance of temples, and that they still call their synagogues temples. J. Willard Marriott, a successful businessman, was also state president in the 1950s. He urged church leaders to build a temple in Washington, D.C. Mylon D. Smith, was the next stake president. Senator Gordon Smith remembers lessons his father taught the family about financial responsibility. Dad came to the dinner table and he showed us a check from the church made out to him personally of a lot of money to purchase the temple site. And I, my little boy eyes were like, oh man, we are rich here. And these are sacred funds that go to building the house of the Lord. Another lesson about money came from children's donations. And the gospel lesson at that dinner table was that this is the widow's might. During construction, workers discovered some vandalism on site until one day a German shepherd showed up and refused to leave. He acted like a guard dog, so they decided to keep him. Judy Emily Cox worked as the office secretary and came up with a name from the Bible. It just popped in my head, Zachariah. And I said, you can call him Zach for short. And so they said, that's it. Zach, the temple guard dog, slept under the superintendent's desk during the day and patrolled the grounds at night. One evening, he refused to leave the annex building. When he let back in to check, they discovered a fire. If Zach hadn't smelled it, I guess, and, and kept telling John there's something the matter in there that it could have been a lot worse. When construction was completed, Zach was adopted by one of the workers. My claim to fame is that I'm the last person to have kissed the angel Moroni. 
That was when he was two years old. Galen Fairbanks is the grandson of famed American sculptor Avard Fairbanks. He created the Angel Moroni statue for the Washington, D.C. temple. Very um, tender feelings about my grandfather. He and his son Douglas visit often. It's just so comforting to see that his uh, artwork is still inspiring people to this day. The family saw the angel hoisted to the top once again following the temple restoration. This temple was a statement of faith far beyond our nation's capital. This was the size of the district for the Washington, D.C. temple after its dedication in 1974. Four church presidents oversaw the temple from its announcement to its dedication, David O. McKay, Joseph Fielding Smith, Harold B. Lee, and Spencer W. Kimball. Every day when I pulled into those temple gates, I felt the spirit of the temple, and I felt the spirit telling me that I was entering holy ground. Meg and Brent Pratt served in the temple presidency before the renovation, but her family has been closely associated with this temple for decades. Her father, Sid Folger, the temple's general contractor, influenced one of the architects, Keith Wilcox. This was after the World's Fair in New York City where the church had displayed a replica of the Salt Lake Temple. He said people in the East, when they think of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they think of the Salt Lake Temple. And I would suggest that this temple be a modern reflection architecturally of the Salt Lake Temple. And Keith really liked that idea. Brent and Meg Pratt believe this temple on these grounds happened because of Revelation. It is a pristine park that you drive right up to, which will always be that way. And it, it really is a marvelous thing. When you read the history, it just makes your skin tingle because you can see the hand of the Lord in that piece of property. And it has been a blessing to millions of Latter-day Saints through the decades. You will meet a few of them next. I said, we've got to have that. This, of course, is the uh, Kirtland Temple. This is the sawmill. Clarence Johnson is the great-great-grandson of Joel Hills Johnson. After joining the church, he moved to Kirtland, and there he built another sawmill, which was used to provide the uh, lumber for the temple. This painting by Al Rounds captures the scene the Johnson family also helped build the original Nauvoo Temple. And Clarence Johnson is now a sealer in the Washington, D.C. Temple. The temple's been a pretty big part of uh, my ancestry, and I hope it continues to be a part of our family. Joel Hills Johnson was a man important to church history, just as his great-great-grandson is important to my family history. Clarence Johnson and his companion Wayne Lewis were the missionaries who baptized and confirmed our mother, a member of the church, in 1960. He continues to bless the lives of so many. I will tell you that there is nothing that has been so, so, so satisfying as serving as a sealer. It's just pronouncing blessings upon people. And what, what can be any better than that? Shane Begay was born in Arizona, was graduated from high school in Utah, and is now living in the D.C. area and serving in a bishopric. It's just knowing that this is my kind of my home temple now, uh, and we've missed it so much. His ward, he says, did an interfaith outreach for the open house. We took a little Georgetown cupcake to them with an invite to come to the temple, and I think people appreciated that. So we have a little corridor of, of, of churches that we try to connect with and we do interfaith activities and different things with them. And we hope that in sharing um, our sacred space that they'll share their sacred space with us also. Al and Julene Jackson raised their family in the Washington, D.C. area. They anxiously awaited the open house and were able to see their newly renovated temple that first week. Al and I were actually sealed in that temple. So it has a lot of significance mm -hmm. to us. And being in there yesterday with people of different faiths through this open house reminds me of how it 
it can be a unifier because our country is so divided. Alan Jeline hosted family members who are not Latter-day Saints in touring the temple. It was unifying then and has been all of their married lives. We had a son, our firstborn, who did not live. He lived a month. He, we had him home for a week. And so that sealing ordinance of us being together for time and all eternity takes on special meaning for us because we were able to be sealed to our little Preston and then and Kayla. They lost both their firstborn, Preston, and their last, a little girl, who also lived briefly, named Kayla. You really feel that shoring up and that strengthening um, spirit as you go to the temple and you're re-reminded of God's plan and the eternal nature of family. Their son Alvin plays high school basketball. He's also preparing for a mission and becoming more attached to temple experiences. It's always been such a great experience, somewhere I can go where I can feel the spirit and where I can kind of just find peace in my mind. I'm just thrilled for the temple to be open. The last time I was there was my wedding day when I was sealed to my husband. Kayla Jackson works for Family Search with a focus on Africa, helping people find their ancestors, just as she has done. I've had the opportunity to do a lot of our family history work, and one of our lines I've been able to trace back to the plantation where my ancestors were enslaved. For me, I think it was just a sense of gratitude for what they did and, and where I am now due to their sacrifice. Coming up, an historic day of rededication, led by a prophet. Each Christmas season, the grounds of the Washington, D.C. temple become a festival of lights. All who have come through the decades have participated in this celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ. From the beginning, during its first open house in 1974, the temple attracted hundreds of thousands of visitors. It was an historic moment when President and Mrs. Ford welcomed President and Sister Kimball to the Kennedy Center for the Tabernacle Choir concert. Mrs. Ford then toured the temple. President Kimball sealed the very large cornerstone and spoke to the media. We're a temple building people. We believe in eternity. And we believe that the Lord is at the helm. A bright Sunday morning in August of 2022 was another historic day as thousands of Latter-day Saints gathered for three services to rededicate their temple. President Nelson led the first rededicatory service. I had an opportunity to greet President and Sister Nelson. This was their first trip since the pandemic, and he loved seeing the church members. Wonderful, just wonderful to be among them. President Nelson recognizes the renewal of this temple, each room refurbished from the entryway to the baptistry to the celestial room. And he also hopes that all who come realize its purpose. The temple is more uh, beautiful now than it ever was before, and it was stunning before. And each temple stands as a step, a sacred step, to eternal life for us and our families. President Dallin H. Oaks led the second service and President Henry B. Eyring the third. This landmark attracted 350,000 visitors during the open house. But this day was for the Latter-day Saints, and they were grateful. It was an honor to be close to the presidency and uh, to be able to hear them, to, to be able to be a witness of a dedication of the temple. It's a place of, of comfort and of joy and of, of peace and one that I get to share with her every time we come in. Can't wait to come back. <laughs> Brigham Anderson joined his mother, Carol, and her parents, who were here for the dedication in 1974. My dad reached over after the hallelujah and put his hand on my hand and just tied that eternal family that we are. I was just overwhelmed with family. The thought of the eternalness of, of what this all means to us. 
The original dedication of the Washington, D.C. temple took place in 1974, and President Nelson was here by special invitation. I was at the first dedication at the request of President Kimball to serve as the doctor available if needed for any of the general authorities. I will always remember the feelings in the room as President Kimball dedicated that temple. The temple's different and we're different, but I still felt the spirit of President Kimball with me. Church leaders believe this temple has blessed and will bless so many. So much of what happens in the temple is symbolic, but there is one thing that is absolutely literal, and it's written on the outside of every single temple, House of the Lord. During its renovation and through the pandemic, Latter-day Saints in this temple district remarked on the turbulence in our nation's capital. They believe the reopening of their temple will bring a sense of calm. It's really kind of amazing to have such a magnificent edifice, a house of the Lord, built here on this sacred land in a, in a country that has a constitution that protects religious freedom that we revere. From the beginning, the grandeur of this temple has touched everyone who sees it. It was and is a beacon of strength, of beauty, of faith, a statement with others in this great city. Latter-day Saints seek the divine and make sacred covenants here. It is renewed. The Washington, D.C. Temple, a sacred monument in a city of monuments.